Welcome to the Automotive Diagnostic Podcast. We're going to explore ways to sharpen our diagnostic skills, find learning resources, and hear from experts in the automotive field. Hey, have you ever been faced with the challenge of sourcing, installing, and programming a used control module in a vehicle? I know a lot of us have. It seems to be happening more and more often today with the volume of control modules on vehicles, the cost of some new ones, or even the availability of new control modules. In some cases, used may be the only option. So what do you do here? I strongly recommend checking out SJ Auto Solutions and Tommy Oliva. Tommy offers a cloning service for used control modules to make these things plug and play for the vehicle that you're working on. In a lot of cases, he is also able to source the control modules if you're unable to locate one for the vehicle that you're working on. But once you get connected with Tommy, he's going to offer fantastic support from start to finish to make sure that that control module is going to work in your application. He's also got tech support that he offers through his website, along with some free resources there as well on information about used control module programming so make sure to check out sj auto solutions i can't recommend that enough hey what's going on automotive world welcome to another episode of the automotive diagnostic podcast my name is sean tipping i'll be your host once again for this week's episode thank you so much for joining me you got just me this week i'm going to share a case study with you this one uh, gave us a little bit of trouble this week. Um, you know, we do a lot of network stuff and I talk about a lot of network stuff. So you might be like, oh, another CAN bus case study. Um, there's a couple things in particular about uh, this vehicle and the style of vehicle that I wanted to bring up uh, that hopefully will be helpful for you if you work on Ford vehicles, uh, in particular, the medium speed bus, which is not entirely, but mostly the interior bus um, runs a lot of the stuffs in the cabin of the vehicle, but they do extend outside of the vehicle. This one will be an example of that. Um, but anyways, I've dealt with these things multiple times when you have an issue on the medium speed CAN bus. And I have found in my personal experience they're, they can be kind of challenging uh, when you're tracking down a wiring problem. Not so much a module problem, but a wiring problem on one of these buses can be tricky. Um, and again, in my personal opinion, it is because of the way that they physically lay out the network in the vehicles, like how the wires and the harnesses are actually routed in combination with the diagrams that are used can make these a little bit challenging. So I hope to give you a few tips and uh, share some things that we just went through this week on one, but that again, I've seen on other vehicles. So this, this one kind of reminded me of a Lincoln that I had been through, which completely different vehicle. And although the actual problem was the same, it wasn't in the same spot. Um, and it gave me some of the same challenges. And actually I was a little bit better prepared on this one because I had gotten my ass kicked on a Lincoln. Anyways, this vehicle is a 2015 Ford F-150 um, that we're dealing with an issue on this medium speed bus. Now, if you are listening audio only, I'm going to do my best to explain everything without pictures. Um, but there is a YouTube video um, that's going to go along with this with a PowerPoint that I have some pictures up and have some diagrams up that will definitely bring a little bit extra to this episode. So uh, if you want to check out the YouTube episode, the link is in the show notes, or maybe you're already watching it. Um, it does add a little bit something, but again, I'll try to explain without the need for it. So anyways, again, 2015 Ford F-150, customer calls, their uh, issues that they're having on the set of shop, uh, front windows, radio, and the HVAC controls all stopped working. Okay. So that's their issue. Um, they looked into it a little bit, and uh, I think they identified that it was network related or at least beyond the scope of what they wanted to handle as far as diagnostics goes. We do a lot of diag for them, so that's normal. They call us in. Hey, tell us what's wrong. We'll fix it. We'll keep the, the train moving. So 
when we scanned it, uh, it revealed exactly that a loss of communication with multiple modules. There's codes relating to, um, you know, communication between modules or lost communication, lots of functions in the vehicles that are the vehicles that's not working. And, um, you have missing modules that just aren't showing up on the vehicle scan. Now, this thing is a platinum edition truck, so it's fully loaded. It's got all the bells and whistles, so a lot of modules. And that can make things trickier because, well, I don't know what's equipped and what's not equipped right off the bat, but um, we'll get as much as we can, you know, with the pre-scan. Now, we noticed there was a lot of modules missing from this vehicle. One of the questions I'm going to ask myself when I have a whole bunch of modules that are off, again, I don't know the, you know, exact extent of which ones should be communicating with my scan tool, which one shouldn't, because that that's a question of especially pickup trucks or SUVs where you have so many different combinations of vehicle options. Well, you can't talk to the global positioning system module because it wasn't an option on that year. Of course, there'll be no com but maybe it was equipped and there's ways to verify that, right? You can use various resources to figure out what's supposed to be equipped and what's not. That can be time consuming depending on the application. Uh, I didn't dive in that far. I'm just going to go through this and see, uh, is there any commonality to the modules that aren't talking, right? If I've got multiple networks, which I do on this Ford, I've got three high-speed cans and a medium-speed can. So a total of four networks on this uh, Ford F-150, again, fully loaded. Do all the modules I can't talk to live on the same network? It's a question I want to ask myself. And a lot of times you find that's the case. If you have a whole series of modules down, well, they all end up being on the same network. And we did find that. And, of course, I've already spoiled it for you. It's the medium-speed can on this Ford that pretty much all of the modules are not talking or no communication. And of course it relates to the things that are broken on the vehicle. So we know where we're going in order to fix their issues. We have to figure out why I can't talk to anything on this network. Now, if you use IDS, which is the Ford factory scan tool platform, when you do a vehicle scan, it'll show uh, standard modules, um, which are ones that are definitely equipped on the vehicle. And then it'll show optional modules. And it'll say if it passes or fails. Uh, now, if again, if you've used IDS, you always see optional modules that fail on the initial scan of the vehicle. Again, because those just aren't equipped on the vehicle. They could be, but they're not on that one. And IDS doesn't have the capability of telling you which one actually came with that particular vehicle. Uh, Chrysler um, actually, you know, does do that through the configuration that's in the body control module and even after market scan tools can recognize what option or what module options are equipped on which vehicle but uh, this version of ford doesn't have that um so anyways in the list you see a bunch of fails under um, optional and standard in this one but if you use the live network monitor right so there's two options in ids you can do the vehicle network scan which is really just a all system dtc scan and it gives you a you know a list of all the codes and all the modules that responded and the ones that failed but it's not live it's just showing you the results of its test now if you do the live network monitor through ids it's going to be a live version of pinging every module and i find this to be really helpful and I try not to rely just on codes when it comes to figuring out communication issues, especially if it, you know, is a whole network or a section of a network, because the problem with codes, uh, you know, communication codes specifically, is not every module is going to report about every other module, right? Or you could have a module that is offline, not talking, and a whole bunch of modules might not care because in that specific situation or maybe ever, they're not meant to get a message from the module that's offline. So they're not going to code. And so relying specifically on codes to try to determine who's online and who's not, isn't always the best way to go. If you have some way, maybe the factory scan tool to do an assessment of the network live, again, like YTech Chrysler will do that for you with the colors on the topology, but with Ford in the live network monitor, you can have it ping all of 
the modules and it breaks it down by network for you, which is also really handy. It'll show you the separate high speed networks and the medium speed can in this one and show you all the modules that are supposed to exist on there. Now, some tips on this, let the page fully load before you hit play or you'll just freeze up IDS. I've done that plenty of times, but when you open up this live network monitor, it's going to load all the modules that are possible for this application, and it will gray out the ones that failed to talk on the network test initially. And when you fire up IDS, it automatically does a net network test. Like it reaches out, tries to talk to all the modules, and your live network monitor is going to reflect that. And you'll see they're grayed out, and you'll see a little box that says disable with an X on it. Now, you can go in and you can click that, and you can turn it back on, but if you don't, the the pinging that it does like it shoots out a little message to each module says hey are you there and then it shows you a visual um, representation if that module responded correctly with a like a green okay um and it's going to show you that on the screen as it's going through each module now you can activate those modules by clicking that x as it's pinging these modules if it hits a module that does not respond for whatever reason. Maybe it's not equipped, right? So if you clicked one of those disabled boxes and it's just not a app module that's applicable to that vehicle, you'll get a red beep when it hits that module. But if it's a module that's supposed to be there, it is physically on the car and it's just not communicating, you're also going to get that red beep. Okay, and I did this with a few modules on the medium speed can that I knew existed on the vehicle. Again, there's a ton. There's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen modules on this medium speed network that are possible. I don't know which ones are on this vehicle for sure, but I only see two responding, which are my rear side object detection modules, which in this truck are actually the taillights. They're part of the taillight assembly. And every other single module is grayed out. So I turn on a few of these modules that I know for sure, like, okay, it has a FICM. Okay, I know it has a driver's door module in this application. And a couple other ones I turned on just to because I, I could say for sure that this vehicle had those modules. And they would all come back with the little red beep and a missing message counter. And it'll count up the times that it misses a missed a response from a particular module. And so you can get a really good idea of who's on the network and who's not. Now, again, on this medium speed bus, and I have a picture of it up on the PowerPoint here, I only had two modules that I could communicate with. And again, those were the side object detection modules that are in the rear taillights. That's it. Nothing else on the medium speed bus. Now, the rest the rest of the vehicle, all the other networks were fine. I could talk to everything there, but nothing on the medium speed bus. So obviously, we've got something affecting the majority of the network. I don't know why I can talk to the SODs, but this is most of the medium speed can has a problem. Um, let's scope this thing and see what's going on. That's our next step is just see is this a corrupted message um what you can tell a lot from a can waveform and you know i do want to give credit where credit is due I, i've taken a lot of training over the years um I've taken a lot of network classes i've taught a network class and i taught it in college and so i've looked at a lot of can waveforms and the more you look at it's a lot like secondary ignition waveforms um or when you know uh in cylinder compression, relative compression, any of these waveforms that we look at on a scope over and over and over again. And this is like a Jim Morton thing, right? Is like the, the bad is going to stick out like a sore thumb once you've looked at enough good. Um, and that's just time repetition experience um, to be able to say, yep, that does not look good. Now, you don't want to get um, too critical with the can waveforms and there's stuff you can do with like a math channel uh, to clear out some of the noise and that stuff. But when there's a bad waveform, it stands out pretty clearly. And I've done enough of these and I've been to enough classes and I've seen enough problems with can that sometimes I can even tell what's wrong just by looking at the waveform. Now, not always, I'm definitely wrong sometimes, but I've gotten fairly good at being able to look at a waveform and say, oh, okay, I think that's an open. 
or, oh, that's, you know, a module that does not have a proper ground feed or power feed or something like that, right? There's different things you can tell by actually looking at the waveform, which is, which is why I think it's important to scope the CAN network, right? I don't always scope everything immediately, but when I see an entire network down, let me see what's going on here. And we'll assess what test to do next based off of what I see. Maybe it's not helpful. I can tell you in this case it was. Um, and I do have a waveform that's up on the screen if you want to see it measured in a couple of places on the network. But they're, it's actually the same. Um, what I'm seeing is a message on the CAN bus. Like there's data being trans transmitted on the CAN high and the CAN low. But when the message goes high, it's going high on both sides, right? So if you imagine a CAN waveform, two and a half, one side, CAN low is supposed to go down to one and a half, CAN high is supposed to go up to three and a half. They mirror each other. It's the same message on both high and low, um, but one goes high, one goes low. They're both going high, right? They both start at two and a half, and then they both go up to, it's actually going almost up to four volts, a little higher than normal, but it's going up in both sides, same data transmission, same, like if you were to, if you were able to decode the message, I don't know that you would be able to in this one. It's exactly the same, but CAN low is not going low, it's going high. And that's immediately stands out as an issue. Now, I can tell you what I thought about this when I first looked at it. I believe it's an open, I believe it's an open on CAN low, which doesn't really matter that much because they're twisted pair. Wherever you find one of those wires, you're going to find the other one. So if you, if you find the open, you, it doesn't really matter what side it's on. Just you know, find it and fix it. But we can actually say that from looking at the waveform is that it's an open. It's an open on cam low and it's an open between the terminating resistors. Okay. Now, why can I say all of this just by looking at a waveform? And I want to share this with you so that maybe you could look at a waveform and start to at least assume the same things, right? And maybe assumes the bad word, but you could think that this is a possibility, right? And again, I've been wrong. Sometimes I look at stuff, I think, oh, I think this is the problem. And then we get into it and find out it's not, right? Cars will always throw, throw a loop for you. And a lot of cars are different too. It, you know, the network construction is going to play a role here on how you know, stuff fails and the, the symptoms it produces once it fails. So obviously be careful and use another test to confirm that you're seeing what you think you're seeing. Um, and I do this here and I'll share that with you after I explain this a little bit, but I want to go through my thought process, what I immediately thought when I looked at this, that I thought, okay, I got an open again, can high is going high at the same time, can low is going high. Now, you might immediately think, hey, there's a short between the two. Now, if the two CAN wires are shorted together and there's no other issues in the, the circuit-wise, but if the CAN high and CAN low short together, and I've done this, and you could try it too, just put a wire across them and look at the waveform and see what happens, you will have a constant 2.5 and you'll have no data transmission on either line. The reason being is when one goes high, the other one goes low, they cancel each other out. And you'll have like a little blip of voltage where there's just a little bit of fluctuation, but it's not really anything. There's no data transmission. It's more or less a flat two and a half line. And so this does not look like a shorted waveform to me. This looks like an open. Now, why would we be seeing the same voltage movement on one side and on the other right now if you look at the can high waveform the entire time it goes high right and which it should it's can high it's supposed to go two and a half to three and a half and every piece of data transmission on there does that exactly there's a little bit of distortion at places you can see that in the waveform but it's always going up from two and a half to three and a half now the can low again resting at two and a half at times goes high, I shouldn't say mirrors, but is exactly the same as can high. And then at other times it goes low, but even when it goes low, it the uh, uh, dominant voltage actually comes up to the can high side. So something is clearly wrong here, but you do see times when can low 
looks to be transmitting a normal message. And you can see this on the waveform that I have. I included both the part where they are the same and then this part where actually, hey, that doesn't look too bad. The second half of this pattern here looks like a normal data transmission for the most part where we're transitioning low. But again, wh why would it be going up to a higher voltage? Now, here, here's my... Um, theory on why this is happening and somebody can correct me if they think this is wrong um it's the best that i could come up with and the only thing that really makes sense in my head so if you imagine that you have an open on a can network um and i should actually I, before i get into this i should mention that the style of network does play a role here um in what we're looking at this Ford uses a traditional bus style where there are multiple modules that are really just kind of on different legs of the network. And we could, depending on where we have the break, it will affect the way that the network traffic looks when we scope it, right? So if you're looking at the screen, this is a pretty good representation, just a real generic CAN bus picture of the bus style that Ford uses, right? A main bus, if you will, with legs that go off it going to different modules. Now, depending on where the break is, we could definitely have some issues like the one we're seeing, right? If it's in the main circuit here, right where my mouse is, we're going to see messages like the ones that you're seeing um, on the previous page. Now, again, depends on where we're connected to the bus, but it also depends where are the terminating resistors, right? If we're if you have a terminating resistor in one and six, it does depend on where it breaks. If we break right here to two, that probably won't affect the network really at all as far as how we look. We just wouldn't be able to talk to module two. But if we break number one or the leg to number one, that's going to affect it. Um, and if we break it somewhere in the middle here, it's going to affect multiple modules, which is what we have going on here. Now, there are other styles of network. I've talked about the GM with the daisy chain set up, and that's actually the picture I have here. Um, those are a little different because those modules all have to be plugged in for the network to be complete. I've talked about that as nauseum on this podcast, so I'm not going to go into that. Um, there is a picture of that daisy chain up here so that you can have an idea. Now... This episode is brought to you by L1 Automotive Training and Keith Perkins. If you're looking for education on module programming, J2534, EEPROM work, key and immobilizer, electrical diagnostics, or drivability diagnostics, Keith has a website, l1training.com, that's got over 60 hours of training videos on all those subjects and more. When I first started out doing mobile, I utilized Keith's videos on module programming in J2534 in order to get my head wrapped around what I would need for the tooling, the computers, the software setups, you know, what kind of obstacles I would be up against when I'm out there programming modules on cars. And it was a huge benefit to me. And I continue to use the training videos um, that he has on his website. So. I strongly recommend checking out l1training.com. The link is in the show notes. So you can have an idea. Now, if there is an open in a CAN network, right, we're losing connection to part of that network. Now, the reason I think that we see CAN low go high in voltage is because of where the open is in regards to our testing and in regards to the message that is transmitting a message, okay? Now, CAN high is still connected the whole way. It's still connected to both terminating resistors. So if I'm over here measuring at the DLC with my scope, looking at network data transmission, I would see on CAN high our normal data transmission. Everything is going to uh, go from two and a half to three and a half when it's transmitting data, but... On the low side, let's say this fuel pump control module over here is transmitting a message, right? We would see it on the can high because the can high is connected, but because the can low 
is disconnected, we do not see that here. What we do see is the can high voltage going through the terminating resistor and onto can low. And my guess is because it is now an open circuit, it is not a complete circuit anymore. And the module that would normally pull that low is not connected to it. So we actually see the high side voltage pulling up can low along with the actual high side message like it's supposed to. So if that didn't make any sense, take a look at the wiring diagram that I have um, on the PowerPoint and it might make a little bit more sense. Maybe I didn't do the greatest job explaining it, but again, the reason that I believe that you see that waveform is because of where you're measuring, where the break is and the modules relationship to that. So you'd see a different waveform depending on where you measured, depending on where the break is, and depending on the module that's transmitting at that exact same time, right? You'll see some messages that are good. Like if this EBCM transmitted a message, it probably looked fairly normal. And there were sections of it that were fairly normal, right? And there's modules I can talk to, like the SOD modules. Now, you can use this to your advantage just by that network test and understanding this and recognizes, okay, I have an open on the network and I can talk to these modules, but not others, um, right? Or my live data or my live network test shows me these modules are responding and pinging, but nothing else is. Well, let's look at the network and try to figure out, does it make sense that, hey, the open's got to be somewhere between here and here? And again, we're going to use other tests to confirm that, but that's what I mean when I say, I feel like it's an open, I, I'm, I'm almost 100% confident that the problem is on cam low, if it is an open, and it's going to be between the terminating resistors because of how the voltage is reflected here. Okay, so let's prove it, right? You're like, wow, Sean, that's a lot of stuff just for a waveform that looks bad. Okay. Let's confirm it with a test that we know works, that's easy to do, and 100% accurate in this situation. It's my favorite tool. It is the ohmmeter. So we're just going to ohm check the network. It is a low-cost, easy test to do. It doesn't take much. You can do it from anywhere in the network that you can access it. Make sure that the bus goes to sleep. There's, there's not voltage on the network, or you're not going to get an accurate reading. But... I got 120 ohms. That proves my open, right? Should be 60. Okay, so what I saw in the waveform and what I assumed that I had an open, okay, that's correct. So now that we know that for sure, let's get into the diagrams and try to assess a plan. Now, I'll be totally honest here. I didn't take into uh, consideration the two modules that I had communication with and apply that directly to the diagram right away. I, it, looking back on this and making the notes for this episode, I should have, and it's kind of why I'm talking about it because then the next time you do one of these, you can take that info and kind of speed things up and say like, oh, okay, I can talk to these things. It's an open, it's between the terminating resistors. How are they set up on my network? This is where I need to go to start testing, okay. Now, the diagrams I'm going to show you here are from all data. Um, if you're watching the YouTube version of this, I just put that out there. I'm not sponsored by all data. I use them. I use Identifix. I use factory service info, but all data is kind of my go-to. Um, they have the OE and the redrawns, and they do a really good job. So I just uh, give them credit here. Uh, so what you're seeing is uh, just a screenshot of all data. They gave me permission to use these uh, for the case studies. So... You have an option when you're going for any wire and diagram, including network stuff, redrawns. I have that up on the screen here. Not my preferred method to go on network stuff. There might be a few exceptions depending on the application, but almost all the time I'm going to use factory diagrams for a whole bunch of reasons. Um, but looking at this one, you can see this is all of the networks. They put all four networks on three pages. It's a little bit of spaghetti. Uh, the pink and orange from what you're seeing on the screen, that's the medium speed bus. A whole bunch of uh, modules on there, right? And I can only talk to two of them. So um, the next one we have here is the factor diagram. Now, I will admit the factor diagram on this medium speed bus and others has not been much more helpful than the redrawns. Now, it's much better for a whole bunch of reasons 
Uh, one of the most important for four diagrams, and I don't know what year they started this, but even within aftermarket service information, you can click on the blue hyperlinks that you see in the diagrams, and it will either bring you to the next diagram because they don't squeeze it all onto one. We've got uh, five total diagrams here just for the medium speed bus, right? And that's not including the other high speed buses. I think there was a total of 11 network diagrams. Five of them are for the medium speed. You can click on the hyperlinks to bring you to the next network network diagram, or you can click on the connectors and bring up a connector view and location and pinout right there on the screen just by clicking on the connector. That is fantastic. Uh, that is so helpful when I'm doing this sort of thing because quite often, you know, doing tests at a connector, it'll show you where it's at on the car, what it looks like, and what all the pins are. And that is a huge time saver. You don't get that in the redrawns. Like, it'll show you the connectors most of the time, but you can't, you have to go search for it separately in service info. This just pulls it up. And that is a fantastic resource. So again, that alone is why I would use factory diagrams, um, but they are set up a little bit, a little bit easier. Now, that being said, these medium speed can uh, network diagrams and the networks themselves on the cars are tricky because of all the options that are present on the vehicle. And I'm going to get into that, but that's where this one kind of went awry or, um, spent a little bit more time than I wanted to. Um, now, before we get into the network too deep, I do want to mention the other thing that you can find in service information for Fords. If you search network just in the top search bar of all data and then go to the description and operation, you got a ton of useful stuff in there. One of those is a topology, right? So this is not a wiring diagram, but is a uh, construction of how the network is laid out, meaning what are all the networks, who's on what, and here's the other really important part. And you are going to need to know this if you want to do this diagnostic the way that I did it. Who has the terminating resistors? Okay. Now, right here, you can see the medium speed bus, our FCIM front controls interface module, and the gateway module, which is actually the DLC, have the two terminating resistors. So that's really, really important information. I'll explain why. But that's why I look this up in addition to the wiring diagram. The wiring diagram will not show you the terminating resistor locations. Um, I'm sure there's another way you can find them in service info, but the topology is my way. Now, you kind of have this topology set up when you do the live network monitor through IDS, if you have that tool, um, but it doesn't show you the terminating resistors there either. Okay. Now we can see um, all the different networks and all the different modules, and I'm kind of putting all the other modules, you know, I, I don't need to worry about those now. I'm solely focused on my medium speed can. I know that I have an open somewhere, and now I know which modules have the terminating resistors, and I can use that to my advantage. So I'm going to access that front controls interface module, and actually the dash is already part for me, so really easy to access. I want to make a note here. Okay, if you work on Fords and you do anything with the infotainment HVAC controls, which you probably will because they have issues, like every Ford ever needs an APIM or an audio control module or a FICM or all of the above. But um, I have been personally really confused by this a number of times. <laughs> and there's an FCIM and an FCDIM. Okay, the FCIM front controls interface module is your control panel of whatever form that takes, whatever you are pressing buttons on that's not a touch screen. Okay, the touch screen's different. But if you were pressing buttons to control the HVAC, if you were pressing buttons to control the radio, well, I guess I shouldn't even say that. There's so many different variations, but the front controls interface module is the actual controls, right? It, it is a module itself. And it has all the controls for usually the HVAC, sometimes the radio. Um, there's buttons on it. Okay. And it's going to be on your dashboard. The front controls display interface module, the FCDIM, that is your screen. And so not all Fords have this. Some, it depends on the infotainment setup that you have. But 
most of the time, if it does have this, this is a screen, and this is a screen that's sandwiched onto the front of the APIM accessory protocol interface module. And most of the time you can't talk to the FC DIM with a scan tool. I'm sure there's examples where that's maybe not true, but for the most part, it's not a module you can reach with the scan tool. Um, but it does show it on the high speed can. So um, take that with a grain of salt. There's tons of different applications out there, but just for reference, and you can always just search it in service information, just you know, put in FCIM and then look at component removal and installation and it'll highlight which part is which, but I've been confused on which module am I even talking to. Um, but FCIM definitely more common on vehicles because it's the controls. And then FCDIM is going to be your touchscreen interface um, that is going to be connected to the APIM. Um, so anyways, I've gotten those confused plenty. Uh, we're not concerned about the FCDIM, although this truck does have it. We are looking at the FCIM, which is a control panel on this truck. Okay. Now, how do I want to approach this? I know I have an open on this medium speed. It's a big network, lots of modules, fully loaded platinum truck. I know where my terminating resistors are. I'm going to find a connector that is easy to access that splits the network into two different sections. And then I'm going to ohm check and figure out what side of the network my opens on. Right? So, I'm going to go to C212, which you see in the diagram here. I picked that because it's easy to get to. It's right behind the glove box. You push in the tabs of the glove box, you pull it down, it's right there. I'm going to disconnect it, find my CAN pins, and it tells you the pins right there. And I can click on that little hyperlink, see the location, see the pins. And I'm just going to ohm check each side, right? So I've separated it, we're dividing and conquering. And I'm going to see, like, I'd expect to see 120 on one side and OL or a really high value on the other. And that's exactly what I see. Now, here's a question. When I'm looking at this in the diagram, I can say which direction is which. And I've included the diagram that has the front controls interface module, which has a terminating resistor in it on this diagram. Looking at the diagram, I can say what side of that connector goes which way. Looking at it in the car is not so easy. So how do I know, right? And I, I did find I had 120 on one side and I had an OL on the other side. And I have a picture of it up here, right behind the glove box, 120 ohms. Which side of the network is that? Okay, take one of the terminating resistors or the modules that houses the terminating resistors that you can access. Hopefully one of them is easy. And then disconnect it, right? So that's what I did. I found my side that had 120 and I disconnected the FICM. The dash was already out. All I had to do is unplug it. And I went to, I think it was like 20,000 ohms once I disconnected that. 17,000 ohms uh, once I disconnected the FICM. So, and the other side of the connector is OL or really high value. So I know from C212 that all the way to the FICM is good. And it really only covers four modules for me. It's, uh, I didn't get a huge chunk of the network, but again, I go for ease of location of the connector and that it at least splits the network into some different sections, which this did. And now I kind of have a direction that I need to go. All right. So um, if you're following on the diagram, we're going to go to K and L um, to a different diagram here to find another connector. Now there's other modules here, like the passenger door module, radio transceiver, I'm not going to modules yet. I want to divide this network up into more smaller sections because there's still a lot of modules on here. Um, the only ones I've okayed is heating steering wheel, if it has it, global positioning, uh, the APIM, and the front interface controls. I know all of those are good up until this point. My open is the other direction from this connector, right? I can't see the gateway or I can't, I'm not connected to the gateway from this side. And by the way, the medium speed is gray, orange, and violet, orange. I know that I'm looking for a violet, orange wire that's open because my waveform showed me that cam low was the problem. Violet, orange is cam low on this network. So just keep that in mind. doesn't matter too much, but at least that's good for me to know my eyes are tuned to see, you know, rub through wire on that, that violet, orange. So we go to the next diagram. And again, there's K and L down at the bottom there. 
And the next connector that I see is 238. This is also very easy to get to. And it also separates the network, but not a ton. Really what this does is it is going to separate my gateway, which has a resistor, and kind of just the rest of the network. But it's easy to get to. That is the key. So I go to C238 and I disconnect it. And now I'm expecting kind of the same thing where I should see 120 on one side and then not on the other. So am I going to see the gateway? Am I going to see the FICM here? So I do that. And where I am measuring right now at C238, I'm getting about 20,000 ohms, like I measured on the other side, is towards the FICM, right? So if I go the other way, I can actually measure the gateway here. So I know at least at this point, I'm good from the gateway up to here, but from the other side of the connector to the FICM, which was this KNL, I've got an open somewhere in here. Okay, Sean, you already knew that, but... I'm starting to narrow down the amount of the network that I need to look in. And that's the goal here with this test is using these terminating resistors and connectors within the diagram to chop off legs of the network as I go. So I don't have to physically look as at as much of the network as I would otherwise. Now, again, hindsight here. This isn't me in the moment of fixing the car, but hindsight, I really should have paid attention to the modules that responded and I could have used, utilized that to get me there quicker, but the ohm checks are pretty effective too. So we're going to roll with that. So again, my open is this way. Where am I going to go next with this? Now, the next one that I picked was C510. It's on the same page. This is in the driver's door jam, right? C238 was in the left front kick panel. This is in the driver's door jam. Now, if you look at this diagram, you'll notice it's on here two times. They show C5, C510 in two different locations. Why is that? If you look at the diagram more, you see dotted lines around certain sections of the diagram. These dotted lines indicate the options of the vehicle, whether it comes with them or not. So the, where my arrow is pointed to C510, it says without trailer tow. This vehicle is actually equipped with trailer tow. So there's a dotted line that shows you with trailer tow. And there's one other one that says premium seats. That's a different section of the network that we didn't deal with at all. But there's trailer tow and not trailer tow. Now this one does have trailer tow. And I even turned it on, checked the dash, squeezed the little button. It popped up on there. I'm like, okay, so this thing is equipped with trailer tow. It has the connector in the back of the truck. So I should be following that part of the diagram. So if you do that and you go to C210, what I found is I could measure the thickum from C210, but not the gateway. And I have everything plugged back in but I could not measure the resistance of the gateway there. So if you look at the diagram, that eliminates this down because it goes to a couple slices and then up to C238. My open has to be in this little section of wire here. And so if you're not looking at the diagram, it's about a two inch section of twisted wire between a splice point and connector C238, which is my left kick panel connector where I could measure the gateway, right? So at 238, I can measure the gateway, but not the FICM. At 510, I can measure the FICM, but not the gateway. And there's just a little section of wiring in between them. Well, that's simple, right? This is where I did waste some time. Now, I didn't fully understand the diagram at first. And this is one of the reasons I'm talking about this. And I want to point this out. If you're looking at Ford network diagrams, especially like a medium speed can, and you see that there are lots of different options for that particular vehicle, which there are in this case. And you look at these actual, like the pinouts in the diagram, let's look at C238, right? Pins four and five are the can wires. And so this connector physically on the car has two wires going in and two wires coming out for the medium speed can. That's it on any of these applications. Well, maybe I shouldn't say any, but on my truck, it's got two wires on the male side and two wires on the female side. If you look at the diagram, on one side of that connector, it has three wires on each CAN side, network side, 
right? So pin four has four gray orange wires going to it on the di. I'm sorry, three gray orange wires going to it on the diagram, and pin five has three violet orange wires going to that that same pin, right? It's not showing a splice. It's not showing any sort of loop or anything like that. It's three wires going into one pin, which is not the case on the car. And here's your key, right? If you want to figure this out and get through the network diagram a little easier, look at your connector and say, okay, there's only two wires going in, two wires going out, meaning that this is the important part. I only should be following one path on this diagram. Okay, now which one that is, you're going to have to look at the options and figure it out. But that's where I got hung up on this because I didn't realize that. Now, eventually I came to that conclusion. I'm like, wait, I don't have three paths off of this one connector. I have one set of twisted wires. Now, which one is it? Okay, now I do have trailer tow, right? I can assume the one without trailer tow. I don't need to go that way, but I do have trailer tow. So maybe I should go that way and maybe that's where my open is. But I have another leg, and this other leg goes to M and N. So M and N go to another diagram, which shows the rear lamp assemblies, which are the SOD modules. The If you haven't done this on Fords, the blind spot modules are part of the taillight assemblies. So from... This connector, C238, we have a path that goes to C327, and then it goes down under the vehicle to the back of the tailgate where the uh, SOD modules are, and then it actually loops back up to the same connector. So C327, which is under the hood, has four wires going in and four wires going out according to this diagram. Now there's another loop here that says without LED lighting, this one did have that. So it's using the four in and four out. This is kind of one of those daisy chain connectors where if you connect, if you disconnect it, you're disconnecting the network in two places and Ford loves to do that. So pay attention when you unplug a connector that has can lines on a Ford, that it's not running those can lines through in another spot. I've been burnt by that as well. And again, the factory diagrams do a little bit better of a job of showing you that. Uh, not all the time, but a lot of the time you'll see that more clearly than you will in a redrawn. But anyways, I know that I have this leg of the network, okay? Now, I'm a little confused on the rest of it. It looks like a big mess here. And here's the other part that's confusing. If you look at the where these two wires come back to, right? At C327, I've got two wires coming from my left front kick panel. They go out to the taillights, then it comes back and it goes to Q and R, which are going to bring me back to that original diagram, which go to, and this is the only place that they go to, is the one without trailer tow. But I have trailer tow. You can't find Q and R on any other diagram. Now, and I actually went, I bought a subscription to Ford service information. And it is exactly the same as what it has in all data and identifix. So they're just pulling it from Ford service info. But I can't find where this comes back to. And I do have these wires. And I'm really confused about that because I was trying to figure out how this all loops together and it doesn't make any sense because if you do follow it, guess what? It goes to C510, which didn't make any sense either. So I'm a little confused on this. And th this is why I'm talking about this because these are tough to follow, right? But pause this and try to work that through your head of like, how, how do I, how do I loop all this together? I sat here for a while getting this together to try to make sure that I wasn't missing anything. And I don't, I don't believe that I am. But here's what I do know. I do know that I have this C327. And what I can do is I can verify that I have connection between 327 and 238. So left kick panel and under the hood. And at least I can say, okay, let's see if I'm going the correct direction. 
Because again, there's only two wires leaving 238. I can see my gateway through 238. I can't see the FICM. I need to work my way to the rest of the network. Do these go to the connector under the hood? That is my question, 237, okay? So I ohm check between 238 and 327, specifically looking at the violet orange cam low wire, and I have continuity. So I know that I'm going this way. If you're following the diagram, I'm going M and N to the underhood connector. That's the direction I'm headed. I don't know about the rest of this. I don't know exactly where Q and R goes yet, but I know I have to move this direction. Okay, so let's do that. Now, what else can I do at 327? Again, because it's an in and an out. I can check to see, do I have 120 on both sides? Now I would expect to have it on the gateway side. I just kind of proved that with continuity, but do I have it on the other side as well? And it turns out that I did. Okay. So if you're looking at the diagrams, the two wires into 327, I have 120. The two wires out of 327, I have 120 with everything else plugged back in the car. So I can see the gateway and the FICM. So guess what? I know where my open is. And I double checked everything to make sure I didn't fix something. And I didn't because that can happen too when you're doing this diagnostic. You bump something and, oh, it's all fixed. That wasn't the case here. I And it, now for me, it doesn't matter where Q and R go, to be totally honest. And I think I, I think I know, but the diagram doesn't show you accurately where they go, but it doesn't matter at this point, right? They go back into the can at some point, but my open is going to be on this leg of the network that has the rear lamp assemblies. Now, wait a second, Sean. You said those are the only ones you could talk to. I'll, I'll get there, but this is where my open is. Okay, let's prove it. I ohm check it. You could see the picture. I'm going to two and four. The connector's flipped over there, but it's two and four. I'm OL. And so I have got an open on this leg of the network, specifically on the violet orange. Now, this is under the hood, left front under the hood, and this goes all the way back to the rear tail light. So it's not a short section of wiring, but I do have another connector and some splice points that I can go to for checks next, right? To eliminate this down just a little bit more. Uh, C405 is the next one. It's at the rear of the vehicle near the tailgate. That's the one I'm going to go to next. And I'll check there and I'll see, okay, do I have my open pass there or is it between that connector, you know, somewhere along the frame rail and up at... 327. That's that's where I'm going next. Now, here's here's the thing that I was thinking about because I could talk to these modules and only these modules and my gateway module, my scan tool is over here. The open's got to be on this side. Now, it could be anywhere from this splice up to this connector, but it's got to be on this side. Irregardless, I'm still going to go there. I'm going to check it and we'll see what we can get. But I'm not expecting to see an open between 4 and 13 and 3 and 5. Like those should be solid given the ability to talk to these modules. This is about the time I started thinking about it. Like, well, why can't I talk to these modules? And now I'm headed this way for an open. Well, it's because those were the only ones still connected to CAN low and connected to my scan tool. Had I been on the other side of the network, jumped into CAN, I probably could have talked to all of the modules except for the SODs, right? Right. CAN's really robust and an open in itself, or I shouldn't say an open, a terminating resistor being removed all by itself isn't enough to totally kill CAN network. Could you cause some disruption? Sure. But I've had case studies and I've talked about the GM trucks out there with open terminating resistors on the back side of the network underneath the vehicle. And they're driving away around that way for years with no issues. And then we finally run into one and it needs a fuel pump control module and we can't talk to it with certain scan tools. Well, like the top down won't talk to those trucks when they have an open resistor, but the rest of the car is fine <laughs> and it can transmit messages. But an open wire, depending on where it is, will eliminate communication possibility between certain modules, right? So what I'm getting at there is it's not just the fact that the resistance is missing. It's the fact that there's an open in a specific spot 
that is not allowing can high or can low to be able to connect electrically to the network in the way that it's supposed to. So anyways, um, let's go back there to C405 at the back of the truck. This was a visual uh, inspection that found it. I was just going to the connector for testing and you can see in the picture, the violet orange wire was open very clear and easy once I got back there, but I had to, you know, get pushed in that direction to find it. So just an open wire caused, you know, half the truck to stop working, but that's the sort of thing that we are going to be running into more and more often on these vehicles, because like I mentioned, this medium speed can routes in, out, and around, and through everything, and these diagrams can be tough to follow. So there's a couple other things I wanted to point out here. Again, why could I only talk to those SOD modules? That was because they were the only ones that were connected to the CAN low or the can the part of CAN low that my gateway and scan tool were connected to. Right. Had I been on the other side, I could talk to everything else. But you can see where the open is here in the diagram. That's why I could only talk to those two modules, or those are the only ones responding to the live vehicle test. Now, what about the diagram? Because I did look into this a little bit, and I was like, am I sure I'm using the right diagram? And I tried a couple different years. I tried Ford service information. Ford was the same. 14 is completely different, totally different truck. 16, however, does have a little bit of a different setup. Now, uh, you can see we have the same setup with the rear SOD modules, but Q&R actually goes to a place that makes sense, right? It, it leaves that 238, goes out to the side detection modules, comes back to a splice point that if these were the diagrams that I'm showing here on a 16 F-150, this would have made complete sense and I wouldn't have thought twice about the network diagram. I would have followed along and it would have been fine. But it's not exactly that it's just like a split year because the connectors are completely different. They are in the same locations, but this one under the hood is C-316. It's a completely different uh, setup. It's got 25 pins instead of the 12. Um, and then there was another different connector. So it's not like you could just use a 16 on this and get by the 15 diagram, in my opinion, is just inaccurate or at least really tough to follow because the, the Q and the R part of it is what really throws me is these just lead back to C510. They lead back to a section that this truck didn't have. So where those actually go, I think they come back to these two slice points at, at some point, but is very unclear as to where that is. Um, and then also at uh, this point, you have two wires. My guess, my guess is that these don't exist either. Uh, it's very, very confusing and they definitely do not have this laid out right. So if you're looking at a 2015 Ford F-150 and you're doing something on the medium speed bus, eh, just be cautious because uh, this one's not labeled right. As far as I'm concerned, you can tell me if you think differently. Maybe tell me if you have experienced something like this. Um, but that, that one definitely threw a wrench in the works um, until I kind of use some logic to sort through it. Uh, to get there. And eventually you do get there, but it was a tricky one for sure. And that's why I want to share it. And hopefully this helps you. Um, but that's all I got for today. Thank you for listening. Thanks for all the feedback. I always appreciate it. Uh, hey, if you're going to be in Vegas for Apex or SEMA, hit me up. We're going to have the whole team there, ST Mobile. I'll be recording the podcast live. Uh, we'll have a great time. So if you are in Vegas for that, give me a shout. Otherwise, let's all get out there, start fixing the world one car at a time. Thank you.